story shall the good man teach his son, and never a day should go by, from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. War is often a foreign concept. It speeds past and around us in an incomprehensible blur of media. We hear it on the radio, see it in the movies. It is just so hard to believe that something so insane could be the pinnacle of our nation's respect and honor. Although epic and explosive portrayals of war often hold true, there are other stories to be told. Stories from the men of our country who have been forever molded by their lives and service. Stories from the men of our country who have strove to find humor and happiness in the darkest of times. Stories from the veterans of the United States military, part of our nation's heritage. On my birthday, uh, 1944, we had an explosion of powder aboard the ship, uh, and they were loading it all through the day, and we had a bad uh, load of powder, gunpowder, for the main battery. And that night, on 1944, uh, they had a terrible fire in the hole down in the lower part of the ship. And uh, quite a few guys were burnt very badly. I think we lost one or two. And if you've ever seen anybody burned, it's awful, awful. That was on my birthday, too, 1945. Not 1944. I think I was 18 years old then. That uh, the night we came back from being at sea, we were at sea for three years. And we came back into San Francisco, and that night we had freedom, we had liberty, and I had an accident. I can't describe the accident, but it was in the Purple Heart accident. And uh, I ended up in the hospital. This is the first night on the beach, and I went to Treasure Island, which had a naval hospital, and uh, had some surgery. Then I went to uh, Yosemite National Park in California, where they had another hospital, and I was there for two or three months. And it was quite an experience. And while I was off the ship, I didn't, I never went back on the ship after that. All the things that I had saved and collected and everything were all destroyed and lost and everything. So I have nothing to show other than me. casualties were inflicted by our, by, well, I guess one man was just that when the bomber came over. When I say a bomber, it was just a small plane with a man who dropped the bomb out of his hand, and it, it was enough, it just happened to hit close enough to just nick one of our people, but that was all. But uh, construction work's very dangerous, and um, we were paving um, the field at later date, and um, we were paving a runway which is 150 feet wide, and we were paving. When you start to pave, you had to start in the center of the field, center line, and the airfield remained fully operational. So you had jet aircraft flying out, fully loaded with bombs and so forth, on half the field, and we were trying to pave down this center line. Um, we had people. The most of the injuries were people jumping off the equipment for fear, but we did. Then one time, they a plane was going off with a very heavy load of napalm and bombs and using JATO, Jet Assisted Takeoff. <clears throat> one of the jets didn't go, one did. The plane just turned and, and flew right into our asphalt plant, uh, burned it to the ground, killed the pilot, and killed all our people who were in the plant. There's not a lot, fortunately, about four or five. 
But uh, so those were my, our primary casualties, the usual ones. I got, I'll tell you another one. It's very easy. You know, we're so used to in the United States using equipment. We're mechanized. We're motorized. And we had pretty good equipment by the time we got there. And we were be, building big drainage ditches to get the water off this field we were working on because it was all rice paddy. Well, this equipment gets stuck. And we finally found the most efficient way to dig these big ditches was to hire a Korean with an ox. And he'd take a 55-gallon drum, flatten it out, and make it like a little wedge, and take some wire and hold it, and you just dig it, take it up on the other side, turn around, come back down again, and dig 40, 40 50-foot wide trenches. And it was much quicker, much fit more efficient in the equipment. So that's an unusual situation. <laughs> ship on a six-month tour over in, in the Mediterranean in 1948. So we were over there with the uh, Sixth Fleet, and our uh, group was coming back to Lejeune because we were relieved by another uh, uh, group of Marines. And our ship turned around from the rocks of Gibraltar, turned around, and it went straight towards Haifa, Palestine. And uh, once we got to Haifa, uh, we were part of the United Nations Observer teams that when I Israel became a state on the 14th of May, 1948, uh, the next day after the uh, occupation forces of the uh, uh, British, they, they pulled out on the 15th of May after occupying that territory for, uh, since 1917. Uh, they pulled all the occupation troops out, and the Israelite leaders decided now is the time to make themselves a state, and they did. And uh, on the next morning, when the uh, the uh, British pulled out, the seven Arab countries declared war on the little state of Israel. So within a matter of two days, the Arab Legion had all the Israelites surrounded and trapped, and put them in the old city of Jerusalem because the seven Arab countries declared war on the state of Israel. Well, the uh, Israelite leaders called uh, for help through the United Nations, and they sent Camp Bernadotte over with his staff, set up headquarters in the King David Hotel. Then he got a temporary truce from uh, both sides to stop fighting. And what happened, they called in 150 United Nations observers, and when they, re you know, they came in to uh, Haifa, they looked at each other, and they were supposed to be living in all these different towns to uh, uh, police the uh, front lines so that they wouldn't start fighting again while they were in a temporary truce. So what happened, they found out they didn't have no transportation, they didn't have no communication. So from that point, our ship had all the communication and the uh, uh, jeeps and the, and the uh, radio jeeps and radio vans. So we turned around and we went and 30 of us dropped off at a Haifa unloaded our equipment, painted a uh, jeep and their equipment white, uh, given me a United Nations armband, uh, give me a United Nations passport, uh, Camp Bernadotte, uh, to give me a white flag to put on this side of my vehicle, a United Nations flag on this side, and what happened, we started patrolling all the different fronts were, uh, with the uh, United Nations observers. And on the 15th of September, 1948, Camp Bernadotte had released a report to the United Nations as to how he was going to settle the war. So when that report was released to the world, he and his staff, uh, he and his aide was going down from the King David Hotel to a government building downtown Jerusalem for a meeting. And he had a roadblock and uh, by the uh, Israelite soldiers and the Israelite soldier, one of them, put a weapon in the driver's window, pointed to the rear, and this aide, he went forward on the, on the uh, trying to get down the floorboard. His head was shot off. Camp Bernadotte was assassinated, and consequently, the war broke out again. Then the United States started giving 
uh, the Israelites, all this World War II surplus equipment and all the other uh, uh, Israelite men throughout the world came in to help fight the war. And on the 3rd of, uh, of December, the uh, Arabic countries decided to go back home and left the Palestinians out in the cold, and they're still without a country today. <laughs> First, I went to Japan, and you had to go there for two weeks of CBR school, chemical, radiological, and biological warfare. And then you went to Korea. We landed in Pusan. And of course, uh, I was very interested. You see the different culture, the different people's dress, how they lived, which wasn't much. They lived in nothing more than huts. And uh, then it was on the train and up to the front line. What was your job? Well, I met a lot of good friends. Unfortunately, I didn't keep up with them after the war, which was my fault. And uh, <clears throat> after the war was over, I loved walking through the Korean countryside, through the mountains. See, that whole war was fought in mountains. There was nothing flat, except Pork Chop Hill, that was flat but the rest of it was through the mountains. And they didn't have very large trees there, they were more or less short, small trees. But you could be uh, somewhat comfortable and at peace with yourself for a while. That was after the war was over. During the war, no. Uh, I don't remember too, too much other than that. <laughs> Target, wham! Everything turned uh, red, smoky. All the red lights went off, saying everything that could possibly go wrong is going wrong. I went through my emergency procedures. I felt another explosion. I didn't know if uh, I'd been hit again or if those were my own bombs going off. So I did the thing that most fighter pilots hate, and that is. I told myself, I've got to get out of this cockpit. I've got to get out of this airplane. And so I remember reaching for the handles in the F-105. If you pull up either handle, it blows the canopy off. That exposes the trigger. When you squeeze the trigger, you're sitting on a rocket seat. Boom! Out you go. So I remember reaching for the handles. That's all I remember. I woke up on the ground, I'm sitting there with nothing on but my shorts, and I looked at four old military Vietnamese guys with rifles squatting down, looking at me, and several of them didn't have any teeth, and I looked down at my left leg, and it was going this direction above the knee, and I saw bone and blood, and then I sort of pointed to my leg and they came over and straightened the leg out and wrapped vine around my leg, put me in a net up on a pole on their shoulders, carried me off and threw me in the back of a Russian Jeep. And that started seven and a half years as a prisoner in Vietnam. But when I was leading that choir in that first church service that I told you about. When we walked into that building, we had been blindfolded, handcuffed, and chained to each other and put on a bus to take us to this staged service. When we got there, they took all this stuff off of us and we walked in and we're wearing something like pajamas, except it's got our number on it. Each of us had a number. It's got our number on the back. And there in this room 
was probably 100, 150 other guys just like me. Some of them I knew. I looked at some of them. Some of them thought I was dead, and they were, <laughs> good God, there he is. There's Quincy. So I, I immediately set up the choir because they put us up front by the Christmas tree, and we were facing the audience. I assigned each one of the choir members an area to communicate with, to tell them everything they could possibly tell, either through talking out loud or through the tap code, just putting your finger up here and finding somebody who knew what you were doing, who knew the code. And so when it came time for me to sing, I decided that I was going to sing a message. I didn't think that the enemy would be listening to the lyrics. And so the song was, Oh Holy Night. And uh, even the enemy knew that melody, so I went out something like this. Oh holy night, we're over at the zoo. The zoo was the name of our camp. We, we gave it that. 175 guys just like you. So I'm telling them this information as I'm singing this song, and the guys are sitting in the audience looking at me like, you are gonna get shot. They are gonna kill you. But I decided to take that chance and it worked. Memorable experiences. I think probably the most memorable experience, other than the bullet that just went out over the top of my head, uh, were just the daily flights and uh, uh, some of the missions that I worked on. You may be familiar with the book, uh, We Were Soldiers Once and Young. It's about the battle in Yadrang Valley. Uh, in November of 65, prior to returning home and getting out of the service, uh, I was working that area, uh, tracking the North Vietnamese in that area, and uh, we were uh, responsible for most of the actionable intelligence that was available to uh, MACD, Military Advisory Command, Vietnam. Were you a prisoner of war? Um, well, of those, um, like your your video sound guy over here has, has headsets. Uh, when people were wearing headsets, we would often take carbon paper because there was, you know, we had carbon paper that we typed on, and we'd take the black and put it on the headsets, and when they'd put them on, they'd take them off. They had funny looking ears. Uh, the other one was that in the small airplane, when we got a new guy, there was a um, relief tube in the back of the airplane. It was a tube that went out the side of the airplane. It had a funnel on the top of it. And we would instruct the new guys that if they wanted to talk to the pilot, they had to talk into the tube. <laughs> Do you have any... Thessaloniki and it was about one o'clock in the morning and there was a we were coming in for a landing on the carrier and there was an island in front of the carrier so we had to turn out of the wind. When you're landing the carrier always had to be turned into the wind so you could come in and land. So we had to turn out of the wind and um, uh, so we weren't going to be able to land on that. You always had what you call a bingo field where you would go if, if you weren't going to be able to land on the carrier. And we were scheduled and had been planned we were going to Athens International Airport. So what you would do, you'd, you'd go to full power, and you'd climb up to about 35,000 feet, and then start gliding down. And then I was checking in with Athens International, and they wouldn't let me land, uh, even though that, you know, I was designated as such because I had uh, live missiles on my plane, which was normal. So they sent us to another field that we didn't even know about. So I'm flipping through my maps. You know, you've got enough fuel to go last another 10 minutes or so and we're gliding towards this thing and you know you're just not, not sure what's happening and all of a sudden these lights turn on into the field uh, you know about five miles in front of us we kind of were headed straight toward it 
came in and landed and then taxied off again and ran out of fuel there. And so you'd have these events like that. You know. <laughs> uh, every now and then the, the squadron would get together and you'd have an all white, uh, all, all dress whites uh, supper ashore. And we did that uh, like we're in Naples. And we came back. Uh, at the suppers, they would have a little drinking going on. But we came back, and one of the officers in his dress whites, his, what they did, the carrier would be probably you know a quarter of a mile out, and then to get into port, you would have smaller boats that would take you back and forth. But he's standing there. I remember we, you gave him a lot of grief about this. He's standing there in his dress whites, and he's stepping to get on this other boat, and the boat kind of floats away a little bit, and he disappears down under water. There's Naples Harbor, which is just grimy as can be, and he came back up, we pulled him up. It was just like he'd gone into a big grease pit. He was just covered with black oil and everything. The flight surgeon took him out and loaded him up with penicillin in case it, all of that, but just things like that would happen periodically. It was, it was a fun group. <laughs> hit, uh, which was kind of interesting, we were on top of a hill, and um, uh, as, the, as being the three alpha, I was in charge of the mortars that we had uh, for our um, uh, uh, for the defense of the battalion CP, and that's basically what my job was, was, to, for, was the defense of the battalion CP, and we had our own mortars, and I heard these mortars go, going off, you know, when I was saying, my goodness, what, who's shooting mortars, they're supposed to clear it through me, well, it wasn't us that was shooting mortars, it was the bad guys that were shooting so you can hear, hear the sound, and the very distinctive sound. It's like a doo doo. You know, you, you know that's what it is. You know, so uh, so uh, everybody's looking around. So, oh goodness, well those are those aren't our mortars. And about that time, all the mortars started coming in on us. You know, and so we we uh, we all dived in our in our foxholes, and then um, so I'm there, and I'm saying, well, my job is not to be in a foxhole. My job is to be out there trying to defend the perimeter. So I get up and go into the CP while the mortars are kind of coming in, and then I go in. And, and one of the other, um, we had a perimeter around our CP, and some of the Marines had seen the muzzle flashes from the mortars coming in. And so I went down to that hole there, there and, um, uh, and that that hole, uh, the foxhole had a, what they call a double E8, which is like a radio, I mean, a, te a telephone that's got wires that go up to the CP, so you just pick it up and talk on it. So I was able to call in, and we had we had um, so our mortars started shooting at their, where their mortars were. And so I was I was able to, to look on the on the map and see where where this marine was telling me where we thought the mortars were. And so I called back and gave them uh, grid coordinates off the map. And you know, was, you, know you look on, you know, that's one of the things that you learn at OCS is you you know you there's like these when you look when you look at a map it's, it's divided up into, into uh, little blocks like this. And so if it's in here, you just go numbers this way and numbers that way, and then you report those numbers, and then somebody else can look at the same map and tell you where, look at the same thing and see the, uh, so I called those numbers in, and then we, we uh, were able to silence the mortars and then it shoot us. So just a wonderful story. Well, uh, there is one story. Uh, we uh, we were actually on that same hill where, where we were talking about earlier, and the um, uh, and we had a uh, one of the jobs that I had to protect our battalion CPs. We had ambush sites uh, set up, and so one night we were there, an ambush site um, um, was, was set, and they, I mean, it, it went off because uh, two North Vietnamese walked through the ambush site, and. Um, big firefight down there. So after the firefight was over, we went down to, to check things out and look for bodies and this and that and the other. And, uh, and so the, the colonel that we had was, um, uh, had dysentery and this and the other. And he wasn't a very pleasant individual and uh, lived on beer and Cokes. And, uh, and uh, but we went down there with him. We couldn't find the bodies. I think uh, they got, they knocked down, they got knocked down and they jumped up and ran and this and the other. So we had this, he was 
upset because they didn't find the body. So we all got online and swept the whole area trying to look for these guys and never found them. And so uh, we uh, uh, so we started back up the hill to where to our where our main position was. And and I the normal tradition in the Marine Corps or a lot of other army uh, procedures is that you come back in your position, you pop a flare to let everybody know that you're coming back in again. So and they pretty much knew we'd come back in again, but I wanted to do the right thing. So I thought, the colonel and I were walking next to each other. And uh, so I said, Colonel, I said, we need to, we need to go ahead and um, set this flare off, you know. And he said, ah, oh, don't worry about it, you know. So I said, no, I so we, we really ought to do it. He said, well, go ahead and shoot the flare off, you know. So I, it's one of these flares that's very long, and it's got like a uh, thing at the bottom that sets it off, and you're supposed to hit it on the ground. And then it, it goes off well. I hit it on this on this rock, and when I did, it went off. But it, it turned it a little bit, and it went off. It hit the corner right at the bottom, mm -hmm. it lit up the whole area. And so, uh, so that was a kind of a funny experience. And then he chased me up the hill, so uh, I survived. are about eight to ten feet tall. Uh, they are jet satin black except for their face which looks like a white mask and they have about six foot long tails and they would take and uh, throw large stones at us uh, when we would get close to their banana trees and once upon a time we were allowed to kill them so we shot some, some rock apes and then uh, uh, the environmentalists got upset with us and they, they had uh, gone to the uh, upper class generals and they put a ban on uh, any shooting of wildlife. And uh, there was a gentleman that uh, was a lead reporter and, and photographer for uh, Life and Look magazine. Uh, these were very big uh, publications back in that period of time. Um, not only with the breadth and scope of what they covered, but literally these magazines were probably that tall and that wide. You don't see magazines that size any longer. And a gentleman by the name of uh, David Duncan was assigned to Vietnam. And he had been a, a, a global hunter. And he gained permission from the generals to come and shoot one of the rock apes. Well, we were on the top of this mountain and uh, we had uh, a squad of Marines there, and that's about 15. And we would take turns on the top, uh, and we, would, we were observing, again, all of the uh, routes and potential routes uh, coming in from the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, on this occasion, Mr. Duncan came, and uh, he was greeted, and he had uh, this very large uh, elephant-like gun with a huge scope on it. And we told him that evening about all of the characteristics that uh, the rock eggs had displayed, what time they would come out, uh, where they would be sitting, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, he cut a deal with uh, four of us that if he were to shoot a rock ape, would we go across, climb down the canyon, cross the rock bed on the bottom, and hold the rock ape up, and he would put our picture on the front cover of Life and Look magazine. So we definitely said, yes, we'd be glad to do that. So we prepared most of the night. Uh, a lot of long 60-foot ropes. Uh, and you've, you've seen them probably in some of the movies. They have a big hook on the end. It's called a grappling hook. And we positioned those to climb down the mountain because it's a very sheer cliff uh, of about probably 600 feet. And uh, he did shoot uh, the next morning. He did hit the rock ape. Uh, we climbed over the side. And it took us about four hours to get to where the rock ape uh, had uh, fallen. And by that time, uh, the, the colony of, of rock apes had come out and taken the body and hidden it. And they were trying to encircle us. Well, we got close enough to see them, and they had about three-inch teeth. And uh, we decided we were not going to follow them in any of the caves uh, uh, to follow the blood trail. So we came back, and literally we didn't get back until about 10.30 at night because the climb back... Uh, was probably one of the more exhausting things physically I've ever done in my life. But uh, that, that's, that's one of the occasions that, uh, and we had fun doing it too, and uh, uh, we got to talk about that uh, during a lot of boring times over the uh, ensuing months. 
Well, I have a good friend from Chicago, and my family, I'd always talked about him, and uh, his nickname is the Grease Man. And Grease Man had been, he had been hit and medevaced, and he was gone for about uh, 90 days. And when he came back, uh, he was very skittish, and uh, we had just come back from an operation and had been out uh, probably eight or 10 weeks. And we came back to our rear area, which was at Dong Ha. And in Dong Ha, being a rear area, there were multiple Marine uh, battalions that, that were there. And if, you, you know, if you're a maverick enough and you, you search around, you can find out who's eating what on whatever day. So all these different mess halls or chow halls are, are out there. And we knew that if we'd go over to um, one nine, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, uh, that they were having flounder. So we'd go over there and eat flounders. And then we'd come back and we'd go over to uh, another Marine area and we would eat uh, steak. And then we'd come back and uh, on this particular occasion we'd had flounder and we'd had steak. And Reese Man is, is a big guy. He's about 6'5 and 2.30ish uh, uh, at the time. And he was still hungry. So I said, well, we can go down to uh, the 26th Marines I heard they have lobster down there. And he said, well, how far is it? So he said, it's about a half a mile. He said, but that's close to the airstrip. And you know, I, I just got hit 90 days ago and I don't want to get any more shrapnel. So come on, don't worry. I know where all of the fighting holes are. I know where all the bumpers are, which I did. And, but I was really setting the grease man up. And we went down and we got some lobster and we were about halfway through our lobster and the uh, North Vietnamese army began mortaring the airstrip, and we got up and ran. And Grease Man said, to, by running behind me, "Where is where? Do, where do we? Where do we go? Where do we go?" I said, "Behind this tent. Behind this tent." Well, when he took the right, I took the left because I knew behind the tent there was a huge pit called a grease pit, where they had been dumping the grease from all of these uh, chow halls for months, probably, and uh, the top of it was like Crisco. And he jumped in there, and the grease was up to here on him. And when he came out, we could smell him all the way from Charlotte to Matthews, just about. And everyone, it was just one of the most hilarious things around. Well, he tried to get even with me for months on the end, and finally did. And uh, we had to take, in fact, on his situation, we had to burn all of his clothes because we never could get them clean. And, and he got even with me on another little, uh, uh, joking situation. We had been on patrol all day, came back, we were in the bunker asleep, and when I woke up, uh, there was one light bulb hanging from a cord in, in there, very dimly lit, and it was swinging back and forth, and artillery was going off everywhere, and I looked around and everyone was gone. And so I was the only one in there, and Grease Man had let everyone else out, and they were in a fighting hole laughing because I was the only one there, and they knew that I would think that we had gotten overrun, which I did. And when I got in the fighting hole, they were just laughing, having a good time with me. And that's, uh, again, that's sort of the uh, Marine Corps uh, uh, jokester mindset. rocket attacks, um, there was one guy that liked to listen to his Walkman particularly loud, and he was also kind of a scaredy cat, uh, Sergeant Hartman, I think, of, of this, if I'm remembering his name right. And I remember all of us um, talking to each other, planning it out, that we would jump up as if we were being attacked with the rockets, just to see what he would do. And um, we did that, coordinated, everybody jumped up and started running. And he jumped up and threw his Walkman down and it flew to pieces. So, of course, we thought that was funny. He didn't think it was that funny. Um, I also played an April Fool's joke, which made it all the way back to the United States. And then I subsequently got into quite a bit of trouble. But when we were in Kuwait City, um, again, we took over all air traffic control operations there. We had a very small detachment of Air Force loadmasters, folks responsible for taking things off of and putting onto aircraft and it was April 1st. And they had played an April Fool's joke on us as we were getting into the tower, so I decided to play one back. 
So I called them and said, uh, about 30 miles out on final is a, a C-5, B Galaxy, which is the largest aircraft in the free world. And um, they, they said, are you sure? And I said, it's affirmative. Uh, aircraft about 30 miles out. And um, so w looking from our tower point of view, you could see all of their vehicles move out to the runway, all of them, <laughs> 20 or 30 vehicles, just or people running out there with vehicles and everything. And at about the normal time that an aircraft would take to fly 30 miles to five, six mile final for the runway, um, I called them again and I said, C5B on final, call sign is Fox Oscar Lima, meaning fool. And they called back and they said, say again, what is the call sign? And I said, Fox Trot Oscar Oscar Lima. And they said, so this is a joke tower? I said, affirmative. And uh, what I found out later, and when I was being yelled at quite a bit, was that they, as soon as they got the initial call, called to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Riyadh didn't know anything about it, so their one-star general called back to the United States to the two-star general to say, we don't know about the C-5, what in the world's going on? And they said, there is no C-5, call back. And by that time, they had verified that that was a joke. And uh, so I was, uh, I got into quite a bit of trouble for that. A lot of people blamed me within our unit of about 100 troops that, um, I was the reason why we were delayed in being sent home. So a lot of people thought it was funny, but there were some that believed that I kind of messed things up for us, but that was good. Yeah. Um, um, probably the first day of the war. Um, we didn't know that it was officially kicking off. So we were, we were uh, I was assigned a observation post in the middle of the night and uh, had the night vision goggles on with my M16 and sitting in a post. and. Just all of a sudden you start to see all these things flying over your head and you could see flashes from uh, off of the water, Persian Gulf, where the USS Wisconsin and the Missouri were stationed and they were shooting their the 3,000 pound projectiles into uh, Kuwait to start to soften the defenses um, of the Iraqis. So it was just really, uh, it was just like time stopped and you're watching all this stuff take place and all these bullets are and rockets and missiles and jets are flying over your head. The only way you could see them really was with the night vision goggles. And then you start to see the impacts um, in Kuwait. You see these huge fireballs and they were launching the fuel air explosives, uh, uh, basically a 15,000 gallon tank of gasoline that they had dropped out of the back of the, an aircraft. And as it hit the ground, um, or before it hit the ground, the whole thing would open up. So it'd be, be this huge gas vapor that would sink to the ground and then it would detonate. So you'd see a whole entire square mile of land just incinerate. Um, so just seeing all that. Um, then the more memorable part of all that was starting to see these white arcs coming back towards us, fireworks look like, and you have to yell at everybody that we got incoming fire. And so that was kind of, that was memorable too, I guess. they had to dump them into this pond and uh, these guys tried to drive through it with their Humvee and uh, they didn't make it so we had to have a guy walk out through all that muck and stuff and uh, hook up a uh, rope to the Humvee so we could pull it out but he was ended up covered in, in, uh, in human waste and I don't think he liked that too much but it was funny for us. Yeah, how did the family? It, Believe it or not, the internet access was really good. We could, um, we have two kinds of internet. We have the super net, which is the secret side, and we have the regular internet. And uh, I could email, I was emailing home about every day. Uh, it was not, it was, uh, it was, they also have the, uh, the phone links there were not bad at all, because you would, uh, same thing you got here in the States with voice over internet protocol, voice over IP, we could do that. We could do that there, and I could tap in, because I'm from Charlotte, I could tap into the, we've got an air wing in Charlotte, and I could tap into that and then just dial my, my home phone number and it'd get right to my wife, and it'd be just like I was, I was there. So I talked to them quite a bit, it wasn't, wasn't that difficult. Hostilities 
exist. There is no blinking at the fact that our people, our territory, and our interests are in grave danger. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Thank you.